Okay, I wasn't trying to torture you with making you read uh, an analysis of Roche and Beard, I promise you. It is important to understand the two different ideas or philosophies that people hold regarding the mentality and the motivations behind the writing of the Constitution. Roche and Beard both believed that these guys were rich and that they were elite and they were educated. However, Roche kind of takes the hide road with them. Roche says, look, they may have been elites, but their education and their hearts and their soul was really dedicated to creating a government that represents the needs of the common good and that represents people in general. And that can be proven through compromise, the fact that they were willing to sit down on the table, give a little bit, take a little bit in order to get the Constitution passed. Um, Beard, on the other hand, says that these gentlemen were motivated by totally economic interest. Um, Beard said it wasn't just you know, like the economic interest of the country as a whole, but the framers' individual self-interested economic interest. Um, Beard would have said that the Constitution was created as a representative democracy to check against tyranny of the majority and remember in this case I cannot say it enough the majority are the poor so the Constitution was built to take down any faction that might rise up that could take away the property and the interest of the rich okay just a quick background to make sure you got that um, the unwritten Constitution so kind of going back to how do the different branches interpret this document to give themselves more power one way is the elastic clause the last another word or another name for the elastic clause is a necessary and proper clause okay the necessary and proper clause allows government or in this particular case allows the legislative branch of government to expand their power. Uh, the reason they are able to expand their power in this one clause is because the clause states Congress has the authority to pass laws that are necessary to carry out its duties as enumerated or expressed in the Constitution. The first example of the use of the necessary clause is the creation of a national bank. Okay. The federal government needed to carry out its express power to collect taxes. In order to have some place to put the taxes they collected, Congress established a national bank. When they established a national bank, they married the necessary and proper clause to their express power to tax and spend, and out came their ability to create a national bank. Hence, expanding the size of the national government and expanding the power of national government over economic policy. The second way Congress interprets the Constitution to expand its powers under Commerce Clause. Everything in your world is regulated by government because of this Commerce Clause. I, the air you breathe, and I know I said this in class, but the air that you breathe is regulated against pollutants or extreme pollutants because of the Clean Air Act of 1970. The Clean Air Act of 1970 allows the federal government to put air pollution standards on manufacturers like car manufacturers and factories. That if they're going to produce, they have to produce with as low pollution emittance as possible, emissions as possible. Um, nowhere in the Constitution does it say Congress can pass a law that keeps the environment clean. So Congress says, look, Commerce Clause plus Necessary and Proper Clause means we get to regulate business, and it's necessary to pass this law, Clean Air Act, in order to enforce this regulation of business. This also is true with civil rights laws and gun control. Civil rights laws you're talking about the movement of people, people traveling from state to state. If a black family is moving or traveling from Maryland to Florida and they need to stop overnight in Georgia, if a Georgia hotel does not allow them to stay there, that is movement of people and they want a service. 
So now the federal government has given themselves the power to regulate that. And under the Civil Rights Act of 1965, the federal government said if you are going to conduct business operations, you must integrate your services and you must allow for black people to use your services. So it's a stretch, but it's true. You can't, if you own a hotel or if you own a movie theater, you can't stop one person from another state from coming to use it. And you definitely, therefore, have internet or interstate commerce. And we'll talk a lot more about commerce clause when we get to federalism too. Gun control, same thing. Um, Smith and Wesson doesn't operate a factory in every single of the 50 states. They have one factory in one state and they sell their guns across state borders. So if Congress wants to write a law that restricts the sale of those guns, they're going to look at Commerce Clause and they're going to say those guns cross state borders, therefore we should have the power to be able to write gun control legislation. Um, taxing and spending. Affordable Health Care Act. Um, same thing. The government says that they have the po Congress says they have the power to tax. If you do not buy insurance, health insurance by 2014, you will pay a fee. That fee will be collected by the IRS, and therefore that fee is a tax, and Congress has the power to do that to you. It's a stretch, but it is past the judicial review test. President. Now, of all of the branches, the president has expanded his power the most. The president derives his ability to expand his power from the Take Care Clause. Basically, the Take Care Clause tells the president he can do what is necessary to take care of the enforcement of laws. Judicial, or excuse me, judicial, lordy. Executive privilege. The president can withhold information. Hmm. Really? And withhold information if that information will hurt national security. He can issue executive orders, which are directives. Okay. Really? Directives that are as good as law. Like Order 9066, which interned the Japanese. That wasn't a law passed by Congress. That was an order stated by the, the President of the United States, FDR. Executive agreements are informal treaties. And what do treaties need? Like, formal treaties need this approval in order to become law. Right? They need approval from the Senate. But it, executive agreement, no Senate approval necessary. Say what? Okay. Pressuring Congress. The President has the ability to make a State of the Union address to kind of tell Congress what's going on with the country this past year. Now he uses his State of the Union address to pressure Congress to pass his policies. Writing the budget. Who has power of the purse? It ain't the President. It's the House of Representatives. In 1921, Congress handed over their power to write a budget to the President. Now the president writes a budget, and if he wants to, he could technically impound funds. Impounding funds means he prevents money from getting to a place that Congress has sent it. And of course, he has created a cabinet, and he has a posse of advisors who help him carry out his plans and his policies, and they are all on his side. Well, most of them. Because, you know, Carter had the one cabinet secretary in the Department of Education that went rogue on him. But for the most part, the president's cabinet and the president's advisors are on the same page with the president. So now he's got this giant gang to help him carry out his um, policy. Unwritten issues. Political parties, interest groups, and techni um, technical issues like the internet and the dissemination of information. 
um, political parties not in the Constitution. Something that came about um, pretty much right after the Constitution was created. Um, the framers actually didn't put the um, put, didn't put political parties in the Constitution because they felt that their um, the political parties would divide the nation. Interest groups um, also considered factions. Um, framers really didn't say anything about um, the creation of interest groups. However, they did add your ability to assemble and organize petition and have freedom of speech. All of things that are the source of factions. And technical issues. The quick spread of information. Okay, that's also not considered in the Constitution. I mean, the framers had no idea that the president and politicians would be under such close scrutiny. Okay, and I think that is probably about it for the unwritten issues. So make sure that you also know the formal process of amending the Constitution on top of all of these different ways that we, the branches, have interpreted the Constitution to expand and enhance their power.